So for this segment, I want to talk a little bit about membrane transport, basically how certain um, molecules and ions move across cell membranes, either into or out of cells. Now, again, just a quick review. Remember, um, we talked a little bit about, you know, we talked a little bit about some abbreviations in, a, in one of the lectures. Um, you know, one of the abbreviations, you know, we talked about intracellular fluid, you know, which is abbreviated ICF, and we talked about extracellular fluid, abbreviated ECF, okay, remember the water inside the cell, water outside of the cell, okay. Now, membrane transport, um, you know, first, in order, I mean, in order for membrane transport to occur, there has to be a membrane present, okay. And remember, all cells are surrounded by that phospholipid bilayer that we, you know, you know, that we call the plasma membrane. Okay, remember, phospholipids um, are these fats that have heads and tails. Okay, and remember that the um, that the that the heads of phospholipids face the watery environments, and the tails face toward the inside of the membrane. Okay. Um, all right, so first there has to be a membrane present, and the membrane has to be permeable to the substance that is going to be flowing into or out of the cell. Okay, now basically how cells make themselves permeable to substances is by, remember we talked about proteins that are found in the cell membranes called gates. Okay, and there are different types of gates. There are electrochemical gates, there are ligand gates, you know, that there are... Um, you know, when I say ligand, I mean when a hormone binds to a gate, it makes it open. Electrically sensitive gates open if, like, for example, we excite a neuron and the electrical charge changes and it pops open. Okay, but regardless, whatever causes the gates to open, okay? So, and remember, gates are proteins, they're transmembrane proteins that are found um, within the cell membrane. Remember when I say trans transmembrane, these span the entire length of the cell membrane. Okay, so they open up to the inside and the outside of the cell. All right, so first, that's how cells are permeable to substances. And, you know, we, you know, we talk about the term selective permeability. Okay, selective permeability, all right? So remember that, um, remember that, that gates that are found, you know, the gates that are found within the cell membranes are very specific. So, for example, a sodium gate is, is only going to allow the transport of sodium into or out of the cell. Okay, a uh, potassium gate is only going to allow the transfer of potassium, you know, into or out of the cell. Okay, sodium will not be moving through these and vice versa. All right, so that's what we mean when we say cells are selectively permeable. All right, or, so, or the concept of selective permeability. Okay. So um, now, gate now, now these um, these cells can make themselves more permeable to something by just adding or taking away. Well, by they can become more permeable. Let's say we we'll use sodium for example. Okay, a cell can become more permeable to sodium by just producing more proteins to to add more sodium gates to the cell membrane. Okay. Um, so therefore, if we if we add more sodium gates to be open. That means more sodium can flow into or out of the cell, all right? Um, and vice versa, a cell can become less permeable to a substance by taking away the gates, okay? And cells do this all the time. Cells adjust their permeability based on the environments that they're in and the needs of the cell, okay? So that's the concept of selective permeability, all right? Um, now, another thing I want to talk about was the difference between passive and active transport. Okay, when we say passive transport, okay, uh, we mean no energy. Okay, we don't actually burn energy um, to undergo passive transport, okay. Whereas active transport, okay, this is where we utilize energy, okay, in the form of ATP. You guys remember talking about ATP from your intro biology class. Okay, cellular fuel, basically. All right. Now, when we talk about this, though, when we talk about the difference between active, passive, and active transport, okay, we have to talk about something called the concentration gradient. 
excuse me. And basically what a concentration gradient is, all right, so let's kind of draw another cell here. All right, so what a concentration gradient is, it's basically a difference in concentration across the cell membrane, okay? So, for example, let's talk about sodium. See that on there? No. Can you see that? So let's talk, so let's use sodium as an example. Okay. So let's say we're talking about a cell, and let's say there are, I don't know, let's just say there are 150 sodium ions on the outside of the cell, and let's say there are only five sodium ions on the inside. Okay. Now we have created a concentration gradient, meaning there is not an equal amount of sodium on both sides of the cell membrane, on the inside versus the outside, okay? So naturally, if I open one of these sodium-specific gates, okay, regardless of how we open it, okay, if one of these sodium-specific gates open, now the question you should ask yourself is what direction is sodium going to travel? It's going to travel in, very good. Okay, because remember, when we talk about passive, when it comes to passive transport, okay, basically what's going to happen are, you know, our molecules or atoms are, are just going to move down their concentration gradient from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. That's passive transport. So we just, so, so, the, so the cell becomes permeable to sodium by opening its gate, and just because of the difference in concentration, sodium moves across the membrane inside the cell. Okay, and then the movement, is, so then the question you should be asking yourself then, let's say we just leave the gate open, okay, we don't close the gate, okay, when is the movement of sodium going to stop? Exactly, when we reach an equilibrium on both sides. So let's say, you know, eventually we get to 75 and 75 on each side, now there's an equal movement of sodium on each side. Now there will be no net movement. Okay, that's exactly it. So, and, and, but, so hypothetically, if we leave that gate open, sodium is just going to move inward until the concentrations become equal across the membrane. But, the, but typically in the human body, it doesn't work that way. Okay, usually gates open and close, you know, over a very brief, you know, fast period of time. Okay, so that is, is basically passive transport. Okay, now active transport is when we move against the concentration gradient, meaning, let's say we want to transfer the sodium outside of the cell, okay? Normally, so that would be working against the concentration gradient. That's going to require work, okay? So as a result, there are some, there are some uh, membrane pumps that do do this. They're called sodium-potassium pumps, okay? We'll talk more about these um, when I talk about membrane potential. Okay, but um, but sodium potassium pumps move sodium and potassium in the, in opposite to their concentration gradients. So normally in in in, in living organisms, it typically in the, you know, complex living organisms like us, you find more sodium in the extracellular fluid than in the intracellular fluid. So naturally, like I said, if I open the gate, it wants to go in. Okay, but these sodium potassium pumps. They, they break apart ATP molecules. You remember when you snap a chemical bond on a molecule, energy is released, and then we can move sodium outside of the cell. Okay, that's what we call active transport. All right. Um, you know, kind of a way to think about this is, you know, this is a this is an analogy a professor of mine used uh, when I was in when I was in school. I want to pass this on to you. Uh, let's say, for example, let's say this is the ceiling. All right, and let's say I just stack a whole ton of ping pong balls up here. Okay, I just put a whole bunch of ping pong balls up here. Okay, and let's say we put a few ping pong balls down here as well. Okay, so right now, and the average ping pong ball is about 40 millimeters in diameter. I should know what that's for. So, um, so now let's say I punch a few holes. In this, in the ceiling, the ceiling would be the membrane, and let's say the the holes are about 50 millimeters in diameter. Okay, so there are more balls up in the ceiling than there are down here on the floor. Okay, so as a result, 
um, balls are going to move down their concentration gradient. They're going to fall, just naturally fall, right, you know, right through onto the floor until, let's say, there was, you know, 10 million ping pong balls in the ceiling and, and 2 million on the floor. Okay, the balls are going to move down until the room fills up and there's an equilibrium. Okay. Now, let's say, so that would be passive transport. All right. Now, let's say you want to simulate active transport. So, again, we said there are 10 million balls up in the ceiling and, I say, 2 million down on the floor. Okay. Uh, so, if you want to simulate active transport, okay, the balls just aren't naturally going to go back up into the ceiling on their own. Okay, so you would have to physically grab these ping pong balls. You would have to probably stand on a chair, and not everyone's eight feet tall. And you would have to physically put the balls through the pores or the holes onto the other side of the ceiling. So you're expending energy to move the balls against the concentration gradient. Okay, that's what passive and active transport are. All right, and, the, and, the, and this, these kind of movements happen all of the time. Um, with cells of the, with, you know, within cells of the human body, all right? So this is just kind of a brief overview of membrane transport. I'll make another video discussing the, the, uh, the specific types of membrane transport in a little bit.